Uh, so today I'm going to talk about a particular problem in the theory of transformations. So we routinely sort of uh, try and calculate the growth rates of various transformation products. For example, this is a lotrimorphic ferrite or perlite. And uh, because of the availability of uh, popular software such as uh, Dictra and MatCalc and so forth, uh, I want to point out that there is a very serious problem in the theory that is implemented to work out the growth kinetics of these phases. And, you know, in undergraduate work, we teach Fix's law of diffusion. And we have a diffusion coefficient and a concentration gradient. Uh, but what happens when the gradient becomes incredibly steep? Uh, does it uh, cause a problem in the theory? And I will go into that part in a little bit of detail. So if I go back to 1822, uh, this is the law for heat diffusion, originally by Fourier, where you know the heat flux is proportional to the gradient of temperature and this is a, a measure of thermal conductivity. So we have a flux that is linearly proportional to a force which is the gradient. And after 1822, uh, in 1827 we had Ohm's law which actually is not dissimilar to Fix's law of diffusion because we have a current here which is the same as the flux and it is related to the driving force. The, here it is the temperature gradient, here is the electromotive force gradient and a proportionality constant 1 upon r which is the resistance. So these linear relationships between uh, flux and force happened you know uh, uh, more than two centuries ago. Then there was a person called Graham in the UK who did a lot of measurements of the diffusion of uh, uh, the mixing between salty water and pure water and he published his experimental results and that inspired Fick, uh, Adolf Fick, who was uh, in the anatomy department at the University in Zurich, who also was looking at the diffusion of salt and uh, salty water and uh, pure water. And he was not happy that, uh, you know, Graham just published uh, experimental data. He wanted to get some sort of uh, a theory into this. So he derived what's known as uh, Fix's first law, very famous law, where the diffusion flux is proportional to the concentration gradient here. And we have a diffusion coefficient, which is a constant. The minus sign comes because, you know, the coordinate z is defined positive in this direction, but the gradient here is negative. Uh, so um, the negative gradient cancels out with the minus sign and we get a flux which is proportional to the concentration gradient. This was uh, in 1855 and it is standard material that we teach to undergraduates. Okay, let me show you why Fix's law is incorrect. Uh, and this is uh, nothing new. It's, it's now very well established since the days of uh, Darken. So if you look at a mixture of uh, seawater, which contains a lot of salt, and ice, that ice is almost pure water. And yet, if you observe this for millions of years, there will be no diffusion of salt from the seawater into the ice, even though their concentrations are very different and there is a concentration gradient. And the reason for that is that uh, the free energy of uh, water in ice is the same as the free energy of water in seawater, and the free energy of salt in the sea is the same as the free energy of salt in the ice. So instead of using concentration gradients, we nowadays use free energy gradients. If there is no gradient in free energy, there will be no tendency for mixing. So this is nothing new. It is a well-established principle that instead of concentration gradients, we, uh, so, sorry, instead of concentration gradients, we use um, free energy gradients. Uh, so just to summarize, this is the original Fix law where we have here a concentration gradient, a diffusion coefficient, and a flux. 
Instead of concentration gradient, we use uh, a chemical potential gradient. That means a free energy gradient. And we have another constant here, a positive constant, which is the mobility. And we can expand this term into these two differentials. And therefore, we can write the diffusion coefficient as a function of the free energy gradient and the mobility and the concentration. So this is why uh, you know, we often express the diffusion coefficient as a function of concentration. It no longer is constant. But it still assumes that the gradient does not matter, okay? apart from influencing the magnitude of the flux. Uh, it's exactly as in Fix's law that here the diffusion coefficient is independent of the gradient. And what I want to show you today is that is not the case. So let's uh, imagine that we have a very simple steel which contains iron, manganese, and carbon. And we are looking at uh, the growth of these layers of ferrite, one-dimensional growth into the grain center. And this is a ternary phase diagram at this particular temperature here. And because we have here two solutes, uh, even at a constant temperature, we can have many, many different uh, tie lines. That means lines connecting the equilibrium composition of ferrite to the equilibrium composition of austenite. If this was just iron and carbon, we would have just one such tie line. But because we have these two elements in here, uh, there's a, an infinite choice of tie lines which connect the equilibrium composition of ferrite to the equilibrium composition of austenite. And the additional complication, of course, uh, because we all like to assume that there is equilibrium at the interface, the additional complication is that we have two solutes diffusing because manganese does not like to be in the ferrite and neither does carbon. So both have to diffuse at the same time while maintaining the equilibrium manganese and carbon concentration in the austenite at the interface and the equilibrium manganese and carbon concentration in the ferrite at the interface. Okay, not a problem. There are two elements diffusing. So, supposing there was just one element diffusing, uh, then this, uh, these are the concentrations connected by the tie line. Uh, that means the equilibrium composition of austenite, which is in contact with ferrite, equilibrium composition of ferrite that is in contact with austenite, and this is the velocity of the interface. So because the ferrite has a lot less carbon, say, uh, than the austenite, the carbon will be partitioned into the austenite. So it accumulates in the austenite. But in order to maintain equilibrium at the interface, it's got to diffuse away from the interface, and this is a, of a Fix's law, which defines the flux away from the interface and these two quantities must be equal if you are going to maintain equilibrium at the interface. Standard theory that we teach to undergraduates. Okay, Now let's see what happens when we have two solutes, manganese and carbon. So we have exactly the same form of equation but two different equations. One dealing with carbon, this is the diffusion coefficient of carbon, and one dealing with manganese, which is the diffusion coefficient of manganese. The trouble is that the diffusion coefficient of manganese is orders of magnitude smaller than that of carbon. And yet, you know, the interface has to satisfy both of these equations in order to maintain equilibrium at the interface. So just to repeat, uh, we have to solve these two equations simultaneously, and yet, you know, this term here is orders of magnitude bigger than the diffusion coefficient of manganese. And the other terms are different, but not that different, okay? So we have a problem. How do we make these two equations uh, simultaneously satisfied so that we maintain equilibrium at the interface? Well, the answer is not too difficult. We pick a tie line which allows that condition to be satisfied. So you get long range diffusion of uh, carbon in the austenite but very, very short range diffusion of manganese. Uh, and therefore you get a very steep gradient of manganese here, which allows the flux of carbon and manganese to keep up with each other because a steep gradient increases the flux uh, of manganese. 
So I want you to focus uh, on this part, which shows an extremely steep gradient of manganese. And this condition is known as negligible partitioning local equilibrium. That means that the composition of austenite is nearly the same as that of the ferrite. So the manganese is only moving over a very, very short distance. Now, there are 1,790 papers dealing with negligible partitioning local equilibrium. Okay, 1,790 papers. I did a careful search on Google Scholar, eliminating everything from biology, which also uses NPLE. And what I want to show you is that this idea is ill-founded. So when you look at the, the thickness of this um, gradient here, the distance of this uh, gradient here on the horizontal axis, it comes out to be ridiculously small. You know, 0 0.03 nanometers distance over which the manganese gradient is defined. And here, even 0 0.002 of a nanometer. So this is impossible, okay? It, it's not possible to define a diffusion gradient over a distance which is less than an atom, atom size. And, you know, if you look at the original theory by Coates on negligible partition in local equilibrium, he pointed out, actually, that it is conceivable that at very high growth rates, the diffusion zone becomes so thin as to exist only mathematically. But he didn't go further into, into this idea. So programs like DICTRA, etc., uh, when applied to the negligible partitioning local equilibrium model at a high supersaturation, give inconceivably steep gradients which are physically not possible. Okay, and yet there are 1,790 <coughs> papers published on this. Okay, so how do we proceed? Well, we look at Fix's law again. We have the flux, the diffusion coefficient, and the gradient. Uh, the diffusion coefficient, really, if we think about it, is not a constant and is a function of the concentration gradient itself. So this is uh, not saying that the diffusion coefficient varies with concentration, but it is actually a function of the gradient itself. And I'm going to show you some very simple analysis, which was first published by Hilliard in the context of spinodal decomposition. Uh, so spinodal decomposition is where you start with a completely homogeneous material and it develops composition waves spontaneously. So you're getting uphill diffusion. Uh, you know, the solute is moving against a concentration gradient because the free energy gradient opposes the concentration gradient. Now, uh, in spinodal theory, uh, which is well established, uh, you can decompose the composition wave into Fourier components. And you can demonstrate that very, very small wavelengths of these composition waves will not survive because uh, it makes diffusion very difficult if the gradient is steep. Now, this goes against intuition because Fix's law says that, you know, diffusion becomes easier if the gradient is larger. What I'm saying here is that well established in spinodal theory is that small wavelengths of composition waves will not survive, okay? Because there is a cost to creating a steep gradient. So here is the free energy of a solution which is not chemically homogeneous, okay? So this is uh, supposing that the solution is completely homogeneous. This is what we normally use in transformation theory. But supposing that it is a function of the concentration gradient and the second derivative of the concentration gradient, then we can do a Taylor expansion of the chemical free energy of a heterogeneous solution. And, uh, you know, after doing lots and lots of algebra, you come up with this equation here, uh, which expresses the free energy of a heterogeneous solution as a function of the homogeneous solution, the gradient, the second derivative of the gradient, and the square of the gradient. Now, there are certain terms in here which we can eliminate. For example, the free energy should not depend 
on how you've defined the coordinate z as going from left to right or right to left. So terms such as this disappear. And after doing a bit more of algebra, you come up with this final equation, which is that the free energy of a heterogeneous solution is a function of supposing it was homogeneous and also of the square of the concentration gradient. And this quantity here is important. It's called the gradient energy coefficient. It tells you what cost there is to creating a steep gradient. So I did some calculations and I can show that as we reduce the thickness, uh, as we increase the steepness of the gradient, the cost is huge. You know, you're talking about hundreds of joules per mole when you get down to even 0 0.1 of a nanometer. Now, typically, the driving forces for phase transformation are much less than this. So it is impossible to actually get growth involving a steep concentration gradient as would be predicted in the negligible partitioning local equilibrium model. And it is a fact that we never actually get the negligible partitioning local equilibrium established experimentally. It has never been observed experimentally, even in 1,790 papers. This is a work actually done by Chance and Ridley many, many years ago. Uh, where this is the equilibrium partitioning of chromium. In bainite, there is absolutely no partitioning. So this is just one because this is a displacive transformation mechanism. But perlite, which is a diffusional transformation, there never is a case where you do not get partitioning of chromium. And there are many, many examples I can give you of this, which are in this book, which is going to come out in um, October, late October. Okay, a perlite in steels. Uh, watch my website for that. Okay, so neither theoretically nor experimentally is the negligible partitioning local equilibrium model justified at all. And you know, uh, you will see many phase diagrams like, like this, where they plot the negligible partitioning local equilibrium uh, boundary, but it is of no use at all. Okay. Uh, now, there are plenty of warnings in uh, something called irreversible time thermodynamics that for local equilibrium to apply, the situation must not be too far removed from equilibrium. And that, uh, that sentence holds extremely well, okay? because the steep gradient is just too far away from uh, local equilibrium. And I want to criticize some of the atom probe work that is being published. So this is a paper published in Nature, uh, in one of the Nature journals, uh, which shows a concentration profile of silicon across ferrite and cementite. And this kind of a profile is actually impossible. So you've got uh, a gradient in the ferrite and a gradient in the cementite. And the reason for this kind of a profile being impossible is that here you have uphill diffusion. Okay, and that's not thermodynamically possible for silicon to undergo uphill diffusion in ferrite. Now, the reason for these kinds of profiles being published in many atom probe papers is that with modern atom probes, the data collection rates are very high. So you lose a lot of spatial resolution. So here, you know, you've got approximately 10 nanometers defining an interface. That just doesn't make any sense at all. So you need to use atom probes in a way that will give you spatial resolution to characterize these uh, concentration profiles at the interface. And this is a problem in the majority of atom probe papers that I've seen recently. And here's another one which also does not make sense at all because you've got uphill diffusion followed by downhill diffusion and the interface position is identified over here. Okay, so just to finish off, um, obviously in a talk like this, I can't give you all the details, but it is all summarized in this book here, Theory of Transformations, which you can download completely freely from my website. So this is about 650 pages and you can download it freely. And given that this is a UK-China symposium, I have some good news that in 18 months time, 
a Chinese translation of this book will be available. So it's because it's a big book, it takes a long time for the translation and also for me to check the translation um, as far as I can, okay? But it will be available in the Chinese language. So that's the end of my talk and um, I will stop sharing the screen. Thank you very much, Harry, um, and thank you very much for keeping to time. Um, it's been uh, plenty of time for questions um, from the audience. Are there any questions? Oh, 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 sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, Harry, uh, so uh, if we just use that uh, um, diffusion, diffusion law, you close the great diffusion law, uh, if we do not present the equilibrium, like, and that can it lead to the equilibrium? Uh, you, you are absolutely right. So we need to abandon the NPLE concept and to treat non-equilibrium growth. Uh, in other words, there will be some partitioning and not uh, complete partitioning. And the theory for that uh, is actually described in, in my book, Theory of Transformations in Steels. Uh, but the standard software uh, is not capable, uh, you know, the things like uh, Dictra and so forth, are not capable of treating that problem. So you have to do it uh, yourself. And I think that is not a bad thing, okay? More questions? Yes. Um, Harry, uh, you, you said this diffusion coefficient of, uh, of carbon and manganese in this in iron sphere. And then uh, but when we do this simulation, we try to simplify the situation. And here we not just choose this element which diffuses the, the, the slowest as a control element to handle the situation. Or, or shall we look into we say, interaction, solute interaction between different elements? There are proposed, many proposed ways, simplified ways to handle this simulation. What's your opinion? So uh, the problem is that at large undercoolings, uh, that means, for example, if you supercool the austenite to 600 degrees centigrade, uh, where this NPLE concept uh, has been used, uh, at large undercoolings, if you don't take account of both carbon and manganese, then the transformation will always be slow, okay? And there will be an equilibrium partitioning of uh, manganese. Uh, so I'm, I'm not... Uh, I don't think it would work to, let's say, treat the problem as being controlled by a single element, because really both these elements control the movement of the interface. It's just that the equilibrium concentrations are different and the diffusion coefficients are different. But if we abandon the local equilibrium concept, as uh, the previous uh, questioner suggested, then it, it is not not uh, impossible to do the calculations, but there is no software available for that purpose. So you could, for example, use phase field modeling, uh, which can deal with all the elements at the same time. But the problem with phase field modeling is that the interface uh, structure is never defined properly. You know, you have a finite uh, width of the interface, and that uh, means that you're not actually doing simulations which are too realistic. But phase field modeling would be, uh, you know, if you can improve it so that we can use realistic interface thicknesses, uh, then that would be a useful way forward. Thank you. There's another question in the audience. Uh, uh, oh, hi. Uh, I'm doing the simulation of this transformation. I quite agree with you. The light of a condition of no quick film, that we cannot but this is like the head of top probably is for the loop uh, the phase transformation because when phase transformation occurs always a efficient to phase moving in certain velocity but something lower than because note a light a a a light given a condition look given assume infinite uh, boundary moving it's like the blue bound. So we are now using like the uh, 
uh, a fixed or some kind of uh, 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 value, assume a value for the mobility, and then I'm not done, and then I got the new equilibrium across in phase. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, obviously, you know, um, the theory that I described is uh, initially to yeah. say that the far field composition doesn't change, okay? But it must change as the volume fraction of your product phase increases, okay? Uh, and that is not too difficult to take account of as you, as you stated. Uh, good morning, Sir mm Harry. -hmm. Uh, recently, I was studying the coarsening of sunlight seven times in, in far-light fields during time Mm -hmm. And indeed, took a formula from your Bayline group. Right. That is to calculate a uh, mixed diffusion of carbon in R. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only took a formula, but uh, I, I don't really know what's the theory behind that. Yeah. So that, that is uh, actually not my formula, but it comes from work done by Kakoldi in uh, Canada a long time ago, where he basically uh, treats. Um, you know, when you have several diffusion coefficients, uh, he works out an effective diffusion coefficient using uh, the sort of theory that we use in electrical circuits, where you have different resistances, and then you work out an effective resistance. So I think um, uh, in my book, which is going to come out in October, I've explained that uh, theory in uh, in more detail, but I can also send you, if you send me an email, okay, then I can also send you the original Kirkaldi paper on that, which is which is a good attempt, I think, uh, yeah, on the coarsening theory for cementite. Thank you. Okay, but send me an email, okay, because uh, I can't see you and... Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, one final question. Yes. Um, Sorry, okay, and then uh, we... we you talk about the power interface, which you propose a sharp interface model, model right? And also you mentioned diffuse interface model, right? Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, in the sharp interface model, we probably were struggling to define the interface or moving interface. Yeah. And that's what people have been doing. You know, you know, you know, and if you we cannot apply equilibrium condition for us to the drug. Yeah. If you do okay, diffuse interface, and then uh, <laughs> You know, there are people have been trying in that way to give a matter thing interface modeling. The whole thing would be appropriate in handling this kind of trans transformation. Yeah, so uh, uh, it's a very interesting question, okay? Um, and of course, phase field modeling uses a diffuse interface, right? It, it, it always has a diffuse interface because you've defined an order parameter which defines the interface. Uh, the problem is, that all the important transformations in steels, other than spinodal, are first order transformations. That means you can see the parent and the product together, okay? Uh, and therefore, there is a discontinuity between the parent and the product. The interface is sharp. And a moving interface will still be sharp relative to, say, what we do in phase field modeling, because uh, you must get a, uh, a change in crystal structure between the ferrite and the austenite. Soft interfaces are only um, relevant when we are looking at a, a chemical composition change without a structural change, as in spinodal decomposition. Thank you. Okay. So I'm going to draw it to close there for questions, with the exception of one, which is from David Guy. He's our next speaker. He's eating into his own time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just a, a comment, Harry, about the, the atom probe work you were highlighting. Is that just an artifact of the way that they use an algorithm to define the boundary? That is, if you did a, if you can do a bit better in atom probe sometimes if you put the interface horizontally and then you maximize the z resolution interface and then you don't and, and then don't go and use this proximigram method yeah. and then you can actually make it sharper although there is still a blurring because there is an uncertainty in the position in z so is it just a, an artifact so so uh, what i did was i consulted a real expert who has built his own atom probes uh, which is alfred uh, cerezo from oxford university 
Okay, yeah. and he claims that even the modern atom probes with the high data collection rates have a high spatial resolution. So I believe what he says. Okay, uh, but that means that people are misusing the atom probe. Uh, and yes, uh, you you can turn the data so that you have a sharp interface defined. That's not a problem. That's very easy to do. Uh, but uh, the spatial resolution, that means the way that they use the atom probe is not really good enough because now the atom probe mm -hmm. has become a common instrument, which means that people are using it without being experts at the machine. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. And in training, you can also get tunneling of the aluminium where you, you can pull it through so that the, the, the effective resolution can be species dependent. Right, so I, I wonder if that applies to things like carbon sometimes. Yeah, so everything I've said, you know, uh, I have consulted to make sure that I'm talking sense in terms of the atom probe <laughs> data. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, David, uh, I'm looking forward to your talk, so I'll stop now, okay? Thank you very much, Harry. Okay. Um,